Hello, everybody, and welcome to our session five of our DSDN parent webinar series that we're hosting this spring here at DSDN. Tonight, we'll be talking about the topic of IFSPs and IEPs. A couple of weeks back, we talked um, with the NDSC team all about disability law and education and what that means for us as families. And so this week, we're going to be hitting hard what IFSPs are and IEPs, how they're different at what ages, um, that impacts you and your family. And we have Jessica here from NDSS that's going to share about that with us tonight. Um, and as we talked about a little earlier, if you have questions, pop them into the chat. I'll be kind of watching as we go throughout the um, sessions here. I should be introducing myself, Jen Jacob, Executive Director of DSDN, and so happy to see um, some of you on here tonight. So Glad to see it. Um, as a quick reminder too, next week we have session six coming up and we will be talking all things speech therapy. We'll be having an overview with a speech pathologist um, and just talking about what things to kind of be aware of with our kids, what kinds to be, what things to be thinking about. So uh, really looking forward to that. As I said, we have Jessica with us tonight and I'm going to give her her permission to get sharing here, or if you just want to stop my screen share, Jessica, if it's easier, it might just let you do that. Okay, let me see. And we'll get it popped okay. over to your world. Excellent. Is it letting you do it? Okay. Get it in view. Perfect. Hold on. And like I said, use the chat as we get rolling here. If you have any questions or comments, concerns, just let us know as we get going. Can everyone see the slides? Jen, you can. They look great. Yes, you're good. Okay. All right. Just Thanks make so sure. much. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I am Jessica Cuss. I am the Senior Manager of Education Programs for the National Down Syndrome Society. I'm also a rockin' mom. Uh, my son, Bradley, who has Down Syndrome, is eight. Um, and then I have a daughter, um, Haley, who is almost 11. Before I had kids, I was a special education teacher. I became a special education teacher because um, my mom's best friend has a daughter my age with Down Syndrome, who I grew up with. Um, and she really inspired me to get into education and to become a teacher. Um, after Bradley was born, I decided that that wasn't um, gonna fit to be back in the classroom anymore. Um, wasn't sure that's what I wanted. And so for the last five years, I have had the opportunity to work with NDSS in a variety of different roles. Um, but for the last like year and a half, I've been um, really trying to grow our education programs and our resources um, and really just do as much as we can to empower families, um, especially through the IEP and IFSP process, um, as well as through post-secondary programs and things like that, which we're all not, not there yet, but it's never too early to start thinking um, about the future. Just a quick little bit of this, if you're not familiar, organization for all individuals with Down syndrome, which people with Down syndrome have the opportunity to enhance their quality of life, realize their life aspirations, and become valued members of welcoming communities. We have three key areas of programming, resources and support, advocacy and policy. Oops, did my screen just go different? It did kind of pop off and we're back to the sorry. PowerPoint view. It's okay. I don't know what's wrong. I'm sorry, everyone. Here we go. Well, now I have to go back to it. Sorry. So resources and support, advocacy and policy and community engagement. So our resources and support um, cover the lifespan. So we have a new and expected parent guide all the way to an aging and caregiving guide and education resources and other things in between. Um, our advocacy and policy programs um, are on the Hill outside of COVID. We're actually there. Our meetings right now are all still taking place virtually, but we are still um, 
highly involved um, in a lot of things um, policy-wise. And then our community engagement really sums up a lot of our events and our connections with affiliates across the country um, and things like the National Buddy Walk Program. We have a gala. We do run for 321 um, for World Down Syndrome Day, as well as a virtual event, um, which really just helps engage the, the community as a whole. So first we'll go into individualized family service plans, which are IFSPs. So an IFSP is a written document which outlines the early intervention services that a child will receive when they're eligible for early childhood special education services. IFSPs are for children ages birth until three and all children receiving early intervention services under IDEA Part C must have an IFSP, but specific guidelines for IFSPs do vary by state. So a lot of places, a lot of states, this would be under your early intervention services or um, birth to three services, every state, um, even sometimes within the state, every county, you know, calls it something different. Um, when you have a child with Down syndrome, it typically automatically qualifies you um, for these services, but you will still go through the process of getting the IFSP, IFSP um, set up through the early intervention um, services. So as members of the IFSP team, it would be you as the parent, any other family members that or friends or advocates that you would choose that you would like to be present. The service coordinator who is the person from the early intervention services um, who will be overseeing the IFSP and kind of be your, your person to go to with questions and he or she will make sure that things, you know, are being done correctly and reviewed on time and things like that. Um, evaluators, so that would be people that would be giving the assessments, um, you know, depending on what areas we're going to assess, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, but the providers and therapists um, would also be present. So should your child be needing to receive speech and language, occupational therapy, physical therapy, one, all, some, um, some places have an educational consultant or an education um, we don't have it in Virginia, but it, like a teacher type of a thing that would be there. So any of these things can make up a, an IFSP team, but the main things you have to have the parents or guardians, the service coordinator, the evaluators, and any therapist that would be working um, with the child. So areas that are considered and assessed, now this is across all disabilities, not just for Down syndrome, but what they would look at are the physical development, which is, you know, are they meeting certain milestones, rolling over, standing up, depending on the age, um, sitting independently, crawling, walking, those types of things. Cognitive development, communication development, which also can um, also sometimes spills over into feeding and things like that, other areas of, um, of fine and gross motor skills. Uh, the social emo emotional development, adaptive development, vision, hearing, and overall health. So they likely, they also would check, you know, do we have a heart condition? Is there, you know, anything else going on medically that would be pertinent for the team to know and for it to be listed as part of the plan to give this child the best services possible? So the key components of an IFSP, first and foremost, are present levels of performance. So that's basically, you know, all of the things from, you know, what are they doing right now? And for a lot of us, when we have, you know, the diagnosis of Down syndrome, this starts so early. I know with us, with my son, I think we started EI services when he was six or eight weeks old. So there's usually, there might not be a lot, um, a lot to write about. So a lot of it will be this the family information, kind of explaining what's going on, what your day-to-day -day routine is, things like that. So an IFSP is really centered on the needs of the family. Um, and it, the services are provided in the natural environment. So that's typically your home, or if your child goes to a daycare or something like that, um, the services can be provided there. 
um, goals would be developed um, and they would be goals again that focus on the needs of the family. So, you know, what is gonna work what is going to be best for this child and for the family to be able to do um, day to day when the therapists aren't there. Things like, you know, if you really want your child to master core strength because they want to sit, you can see this picture right here. This is um, our reading specialist at our school. Our elementary school has a little boy, baby. He's two now with Down syndrome, but this is him and his physical therapist. So he's bouncing on a ball. So those are um, you know, different things that might be part of the goals to build core strength or for feeding and the providers or the therapists that you might get. Unfortunately, that does vary state to state based on availability. Um, a lot of times I hear families that they say they will either get a PT or an OT, um, not both, or an OT that does speech. And while yes, all three are very different, um, a lot of or of these organizations are short staffed and so in turn it doesn't make it you know best practice but a lot of times you're not at this level they're not giving you every all three of them at once um but it's really important to communicate your your needs what works for your family you know if you have other kids and you're busy um you know you don't need to be overwhelmed with what's in this plan um, it really wants to focus on the family and the child in the family. And at the, since it only goes through age three, the final component would be transition. Um, and the transition would be what we would then move to an IEP. So the transition would start when they're two. It must start the process of meeting and talking at least 90 days before the second birthday, um, or the third birthday, excuse me to ensure that there aren't any additional assessments needed, that they still qualify for services and things like that. Um, depending on your state and when your child's birthday falls, a lot of um, children might start with an IEP and going to school um, when they're two, two and a half, depending on when the school year starts. If they are going to turn three during a school year, then they can start school services that year if they if they turn three by the cutoff date of you know whatever they could start kindergarten so for example if you have to be five by september 1st to start kindergarten then it would be you would need to be if you're three by um if you're three by that date then you can um then you would be able to start or if you'll turn three in that school year so some of the differences this chart really helps kind of break it up so really IFSP and IEP are very, very similar. IFSP is only for birth, birth through age three, and the IEP then covers ages three through 21, which are the school years. The IFSP focuses on the family's needs, um, and the IEP is um, more child student focused. And IFSP services are provided in the natural environment, like I mentioned before, in your home or at a daycare or, you know, wherever um, the, the child is throughout the day. And an IEP services are provided at school. IFSPs have a family assigned service coordinator who helps manage everything. And for an IEP, most schools call it a case manager. Oftentimes it is the student special ed teacher. Sometimes there's a different case manager um, per grade level. Every school and district does that differently, um, but they're usually referred to as a case manager. IFSPs um, need to be reviewed every six months. And the reason for that is, you know, as, as babies grow and develop, it happens at a much faster rate um, than as they get older. So they really want to make sure that they're staying on top of things, are there new skills that need to be addressed, new concerns that need to be addressed. And then an IEP reviewed once per year. And I did note a little asterisk there because with an IEP, you can request a meeting anytime. If you wanna meet six times during the year for an IEP, you are entitled as a parent to request that. Federal law under IDEA meet mandates that it must be reviewed once per year. Um, the IFSPs are funded um, 
by Part C of IDEA and IEPs are Part B. So a lot of this really just comes down to where the funding source comes from um, as far as the difference between them and the ages. So next we'll get into Individualized Education Plans or IEPs. So an IEP is a plan or program developed to ensure that a child who has a disability identified under the law and is attending an elementary or secondary educational institution receives specialized instruction and related services. So because this would start at age three, this also does include um, preschool, but since typically a lot of the public preschools are in elementary schools, this is just the way IDEA defines it. Now the IEP team is bigger um, than the team for an IFSP. So first and foremost, parents, you are an equal member of the IEP team. I know it seems like with all of these other people that it's them against you, but you know you are just as much a member and an equal participant. Um, the student, if appropriate, typically in the younger years, they wouldn't attend. I know my son um, typically comes in and just says, hi, I'm Bradley and I like pizza or you know whatever else he, he likes to do. Um, but that's not necessary. Really when the student becomes a part of the IEP is in that um, transition to high school and post-secondary. Once they're about 13, 14, you really wanna start including the student in the IEP so they have a say um, in what, in what their um, future is going to be like. Um, a gen ed teacher, typically it should be for the grade level that your child is currently in or the next grade level up. A special education teacher, a principal or designee. So that could be either the principal, the vice principal, a special ed coordinator, special ed director. Um, so basically an administrator um, must be present. Um, if there were any evaluations done, an interpreter for the evaluations, sometimes that can be the special ed teacher um, or the designee if it's a special ed coordinator or something, or other times it might be the school psychologist or the so social worker um, if there are any evaluations that need to be explained or interpreted. Um, someone from transition services, like I said, more in the older years. However, when you are transitioning from an IFSP to an IEP, um, the early intervention service coordinator and the IEP team um, kind of mix together to make that transition. So either um, the service coordinator or the therapist or both would attend the first IEP meeting to transition from um, early intervention into schools or the preschool years. And then finally, any specialists. So if your child receives speech and language, if they receive OT, PT, um, anything like that, then they're, they would also be present. Um, as far as you know, who's required to attend, basically all of these people are required to attend with the exception of transition services if, and the student if it's not age appropriate and if there aren't evaluations that are going over in the IEP. Um, there might not need to be a separate person there. Um, if a school were to say, oh, the gen ed teacher can't make it, can you sign this piece of paper to say, you don't care that she's not there, he or she's not there. Um, you have the right to say, we will table the meeting then until everyone can be present. So if all of these people aren't there, you are not allowed to hold a meeting unless it is you give the school permission to um, hold the meeting without someone present. Um, sometimes the specialists will say, hey, can we go through our goals first? Um, then we have to leave. And again, that's up to you. If you want them to be there for the whole time, it's your decision as a parent um, and how you would like the rest of the meeting to go. So the components of the IEP are similar to the IFSP. The plug this is my guy when he was in kindergarten and that was his preschool teacher who came to the bus stop on his first day of kindergarten um so the iep components are those present levels of performance now this would be more detailed than it would be you know at six or eight weeks old when you're starting early intervention so this would be um, a summary encompassing all of the things that they've 
been doing in early intervention, their strengths, their areas of need, um, what they've mastered, what they're currently working on, um, all of that. And also in that present level, um, which we'll, I'll talk about in the next slide, is um, you have the right to put parent, a parent input statement in there. And I'm going to go into more detail in that in a little bit. Um, goals and objectives, um, just like in an IFSP, typically the goals and objectives, now the goals and objectives will be more towards academic um, and student focused, whereas the IFSP goals are more family focused and uh, developmental. Not that you wouldn't still have social adaptive and all of those things, but you would be adding some of those academic goals um, when you transition into um, the preschool years and, and moving forward. Um, special education and related services. Um, you know, the team has to decide, are special education services um, necessary? What related services need to be um, considered or added? And they need um, to go through accommodations and modifications. Um, typically, this this can be um, either a, a rather lengthy part of the IEP, depending on the needs of your child. I always say the more detail, the better. Um, I would like anybody who comes into the classroom to pick up his IEP and know exactly what he needs, exactly where he should be at what time. You know, is he in class for all of math or part of math? So the more detailed you can be in that present level page and the accommodations and modifications page um, is just the better um, for everybody involved. So everybody is on the same page about, you know, what services and what accommodations and modifications are needed. Um, placement, service delivery, so that's, you know, are they going to be receiving their services in a gen ed classroom, in a special ed classroom, what percentages of their days um, are going to be spent in either area? Um, are there times that the student will be in gen ed without support? Um, is there any backup plan in place for should they need a little bit support, you know, stay with a peer buddy or, or something like that? Um, and all IEPs have a statement that the whoever the case manager is running the meeting have to read about the least restrictive environment that to the maximum extent appropriate all students need to be educated alongside their general education peers unless the nature and severity of their disability prohibits that and the need for accommodations and modifications um, cannot be the only reason to be removed uh, from the gen ed setting. There is also a transition piece in IEPs, which legally has to start by the age of 14. Typically, best practice is to start it in middle school, um, usually around 12 or 13, um, just to get that process started. But um, again, for this audience, I won't go much into, into the transition space since I know we're not there yet. So tips for parents, um, provide an input statement prior to the meeting. Um, there are a lot of you know good examples online and even through a lot of the rock and mom groups um i know there's things posted in the files and a lot of the pages um but i really encourage you to write your feelings and your views and what your vision is for your child and i typically write mine and i email it to the teacher and i say can you please copy and paste this and put it on the parent input page or whatever it is called in your district's you know, IEP. Everybody has a different name for things. Um, and that really sets the tone for the meeting to say, you know, our goal, even though we're only in first grade, is for him to lead an independent, meaningful life employed in a job that he loves, you know, um, and he needs to be included because of X, Y, and Z. So really just kind of laying out your vision. And as your child gets older, your child can be a part of contributing to that vision statement as well. And it will change um, as they grow and as they, their interests change and, and as they think about what they wanna do when they're done school. Um, the All About Me page, I cannot take credit for this. Um, Tiffany, who is a original rock and mom, created this and then made it a template for everyone. I'm gonna try and click and show. Oh, maybe it's not. 
Did it work? Um, this is just a sample and there is a template on um, in the groups and I can I can link it um, for Jen as well. Um, but Tiffany created, you know, something like this that has really shown to be powerful in a lot of meetings. And I hand it out at the beginning of the meeting just to, you know, kind of say, this is who Bradley is. This is what he likes. This is what he's working on. This is what doesn't work. And I think it really, really helps, you know, the team see the whole child and not just the little bit that they see at school. Oh, oh is that yours, John? Yes, I'm just throwing up the one I made for yeah. Owen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I know a lot of us do it, and but it's honestly, I get such positive feedback. My principal always asks for a second copy because he wants one um, to keep. <laughs> um, but it just really helps, I think, set the tone and really just show who your child is and the strengths and things like that. Sorry, can we get you back? And actually the other one I shared was where, when we did more of a homeschool setting too. So yeah. uh, the other, I do have the other one too, but we'll throw that into, um, with the file, we can put some examples of people's all about yeah. sheets. That would be a great spot for it. Yeah, absolutely. I just think it's a great tool um, and it doesn't have to be all fancy like that either. Even if you just type in word, like a few things and slap a picture on it. Um, it, it really does, you know, set the tone for the meeting prepare questions. Now, sometimes you will get a draft IEP of the goals sent home prior to. Not every state or district requires it, so I would encourage you to look at your um, state procedural safeguards and requirements, which would be on your state level Department of Education website. Um, Virginia, where I am, we were not, um, they were not required to send home any draft, and there was no policy or anything in place and then in 2021 they did state there's a new policy in place that if a draft is written the parents must be given at least 48 hours with the draft before coming to the meeting um, some states have a policy in place where you are entitled to a draft but there's not a, a federal policy on that and oftentimes if there's not a state level policy it differs from district to district, school to school. Best practices, I, I like to see the goals ahead of time. And if you have a great working relationship with your team, um, just to have some of those conversations ahead of time leading up to the meeting. The only thing that should be done before everyone is sitting at the table would be draft goals and the teacher's input on present levels of performance. There should never be a draft that includes placement, um, or any type of service delivery or minutes or hours, because that would be predetermination. Um, and that is a team decision for those things. So if the school is proposing something without your input, um, basically it's, it's illegal <laughs> um, for, to, for them to predetermine those things without um, input from the entire team. So again, the procedural safeguards, um, you can find that typically, your school will give them to you at every meeting or they will email it to you, a link. Um, they're the same. I probably could wallpaper a room in my house with the number of copies I've been given over the years. Um, but there is a lot of good information in them. Um, and so I would encourage you if you're having a, if you have a question or if you um, think that the school isn't doing something they're supposed to do, that's a really good resource to go to. Um, for some quick answers as to, you know, what policies are in place. Um, another thing is if the if the school or a teacher or someone is is trying to push back on something or say, oh, like that's not, we're not allowed to do that. Our policy states X, Y, and Z. I always say, ask, ask them for that policy in writing um, because sometimes it doesn't exist. Um, and it might be that they don't know that it's not a real policy. It's just not something that they've ever done. Um, so I really encourage you um, to advocate for your child. And if something sounds off or something is, you're being told something that you just don't feel is right, um, look to those procedural safeguards and ask for the policy in writing. And if that fails, 
then they should provide you with um, something called prior written notice, which is um, basically the re reason that they are not providing a service or taking away a service um, and the team disagrees with that. Or you as part of the team disagree with that, excuse me. Um, when you're preparing your questions, ask for any current assessments or evaluations if you feel that that's needed. Um, every three years, you would go under um, a triennial reevaluation to determine if you're still eligible for special education. Um, we recently went through a change in label because most of our kiddos have a label of developmental delay. And federally, you cannot carry that um, past the age of nine. Most school systems have the cutoff at like seven, six or seven. Um, federally, it is nine, but states have different policies, um, which is typically a little bit younger. Um, and so those assessments evaluations would be discussed um, during that reevaluation period. Um, in which you would need to have another one of the 13 categories um, as the, the qualifying um, disability for services. And if you have any questions or concerns about the evaluations or assessments, typically the school psychologist or the SPED director, whoever is you know, administering them, ask to have a separate meeting with them if, you're, if you really just wanna sit down and and go through the assessment and understand it. Um, you know, I find that that helps a lot when you know, you know a little bit more detail about the assessment and what it's assessing and how it's assessing it and really sharing if you think that that's a true representation of, of, of what your child can do. Share Down syndrome specific information. So as a former teacher myself, I've learned more about Down syndrome <laughs> as a parent than I ever did in my master's program. Um, and a lot of teachers don't have Down syndrome specific knowledge, right? Um, and as parents, it's our job to help educate them a little bit on you know, best practices and the learning profile. And so, oh, my, my slide, is, oh, there it goes. Um, so here is a graphic that I've pulled from our inclusive education guidelines that NDSS in collaboration with Down Syndrome International and Dr. Sue Buckley um, released in December. It's a wonderful resource. I have the, a QR code and a link to it um, at the end of the, the slideshow uh, that really has a wealth of information, but it's a lot of information and it's a big document that we don't want people to just print and hand to their teacher because it's overwhelming. Um, but this graphic that's in there is a really great snapshot of, you know, a student with Down syndrome. Now, every student with Down syndrome is unique and different, right? So they're not going to have every single one of these, but just based on you know, statistics and, and looking at the population, these are very common within the Down syndrome community. So many of our kids are visual and kinesthetic learners. Uh, they have a desire and ability to learn from their peers, um, imitate and take cues from them. They have strength and social understanding and relating to others. There is a speech and language delay. We have the visual strengths visual impairment. Um, this is something that, you know, my son wears glasses, but one of these stats that Sue Buckley has in her paper that we talked about was even students with Down syndrome that don't wear glasses, um, just their focus ability and writing using a pencil on blue lined paper can be really hard for them to uh, see the lines because of the, the closeness in color that it's too faint. Um, and that size 18 Point font um, has shown um, to be to be I guess the ideal um, font um, to be able to focus and, and look into. So you know, just if your child is having trouble reading or doing anything, maybe trying to increase the font size could be something to look at. Um, you know, with low muscle tone, we have the delayed motor skills, um, verbal memory weakness. A lot of that is you know due to communication delays. 
um, and challenges retaining, you know, into long-term memory. Um, you know, short-term memory and visual memory is, is typically pretty good. That's why a lot of our kids are really good at those sight words. Um, and so, and some have the, a hearing impairment, not all. But so one thing I suggest is, and I've, I've done this, I did this at our most recent meeting was like, I printed this out to give to the team just to say, here's a quick overview snapshot of Down syndrome. And it's not overwhelming, but it really does capture a lot of those overarching themes that we see in our kids. And so our principal actually loved it so much that he wanted a bigger copy of it and he put it up in the faculty lounge. Um, he felt that it was gonna be beneficial for everybody at the school, other teachers, you know, specialists like the librarian, the PE teachers, the music teachers, just when they're heating up their lunch to be able to, you know, just kind of read a little bit about Down syndrome. And so I think it's not asking the teachers too much. You're not giving them this book to read on best practices, but at least it gives for somebody that maybe never had a child with Down syndrome in their classroom or hasn't worked with a child with Down syndrome in a long time, just to give them this as just to kind of get their mindset, mind in the right place um, for maybe some ideas on how best to educate um, our, your, chill, your child. So this QR code, and I can also give Jen the link, it's on our NDSS website, um, the guidelines for inclusive education that like we did in partnership with um, Sue Buckley and Down Syndrome International um, is a wonderful resource. And I'm happy to, you know, if you go through it and you have questions or you have pieces of it that you know you want clarification on, I'm more than happy to, to chat with you about that at a later time. Um, and another place to go to with state specific questions would be your State Department of Education website and look under the procedural safeguards and special education rights. So with IEPs and IFSPs, majority of the policies are state run. And so things are called differently. So in Texas, if you're in Texas, an IEP meeting is called an ARD meeting. It's the only state that calls it that. Um, I can't recall what the acronym stands for, but um, so every state does things a little bit differently. Every state interprets IDEA a little bit differently as far as, you know, implementing an IEP and do you need a parent signature to implement it? Are you able to stay put? All of that varies state to state. So if you're having more specific questions about policies and you don't and you're not able to find an answer on the website, um, that's when I would advise you to look to um, like either your local Down syndrome affiliate or an advocate in your area that really is familiar with your state as well as your district, um, because a lot of times your community is gonna be able to give you more information um, from firsthand experience than someone who lives in a different state across the country that might not be as familiar with what's going on. So I will open it up for questions, if anyone has any questions. There were a couple in the chat also, Jessica. Oh, let me see. Um, one was more of, of a suggestion about somebody was um, saying about what to put in maybe an IFSP, but the other one, um, when you were talking about at that age nine, when developmental disability mm -hmm. label might not make sense, if you could share more about that. Yeah, so I agree with you. I believe that people with Down syndrome are developmentally delayed across the lifespan, um, but this is, in IDEA, it's to prevent um, people or students from being um, over identified um, when there could be like language issues or other things. So that is across the board, like no one federally is allowed to hold that label. And, you know, I, I agree. I think it is, um, you know, it makes sense for our kids, um, but they, the federally, they have stated that, you know, you need to fall under one of the other, so there's 13 total categories, so that would be the other 12, which are intellectual disability, learning disability, other health impairment, um, speech and language, emotional disability, things like that. Um, 
it worthwhile to have a lawyer for these meetings or otherwise? Um, that really depends on, you know, your comfort level and your relationship with the team. I personally have never needed to have a lawyer or an advocate, um, but we have a really great working relationship with our team. So I think, um, you know, if it's your first meeting, I would maybe, and if you haven't had really any interaction with the team, I would maybe not suggest that you need that right away, um, just to kind of get a feel for, you know, who's, who's a part of the team, what their philosophies are and things like that. But, you know, I, I have worked with several families that, you know, have gotten to the point where they've felt the need to seek um, legal counsel or have an advocate attend with them. So that really will vary, you know, case by case uh, as to how your meeting is going and how contentious it is or isn't. Um, and if the school is really digging their heels in for something or if you're able to compromise, I always try and encourage the compromise first. Um, but, you know, there are times, unfortunately, where that's not enough. And I'm just going to pipe in my two cents yeah, on this you probably too. have. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think that we all just go about this differently and we have so many families. I mean, you know, in all of the groups yeah. and things too. And I also have a background in education, several master's degrees and could be like a special ed, um, what's it called? Director of a district or a superintendent. We still were always just so unsure in some of the meetings. You know, my husband also mm -hmm. has a degree. I mean, it was just interesting. Um, what I would say looking back now, so Owen is almost 10 and we've gone through lots of different processes with the district. We've been in a pretty small district. Um, I would just encourage people to try to educate yourself as much as you can on the process, um, yeah. work with people. I, I don't want anybody to hear the message that because you work with an advocate or an attorney, it doesn't mean that you're trying to compromise. It doesn't mean that you don't have a good team. Um, right. because I think that having those resources are really important for whatever comfort level you have. Um, unfortunately, I think sometimes people do get the impression that because you want somebody there listening with you or talking with you or reviewing with you, that you're going to be a, a difficult parent or that you're going to, you know, try to, you know, fight the system or whatever that looks like. Um, and I think that can be exactly the opposite. Like people just want to have some supports in some of these meetings. And so looking at those resources, um, whether they offer them through your district or through your local education association or whatever that looks like, I think it's very different across the country. Um, but I, I wouldn't want somebody to go away thinking that because you're working with somebody that it's meaning that you're being a difficult parent or you're not trusting your school. You know, I, I think it's, just such a wide variety and your comfort level. And, you know, I, I know that there are some families that, you know, they just don't have the time to dig into all of this the way that they want to. And so working with somebody as an advocate or whatever that looks like um, can be helpful for them and getting what they need um, for their child out of school. And I always encourage parents to, you know, don't go in with guns blazing on this. Like so right. many people have such great experiences with schools and, you know, get exactly what they're hoping for out of it for their child and for their family. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes schools get a bad rap. I think sometimes parents get a bad rap on what this can look like when, you know, genuinely everybody almost always, you know, I'm sure there are some cases want the best thing for those kids. And, you know, they are all trying right. to work within the systems. And I think that was my two cents of frustration for us is that we were asking for things that were very reasonable and totally doable. It's just that they hadn't done some of it before. So they couldn't think outside the box of how it was generally happening in school. And so that's where our frustrations got to be. Um, and so we did end up using an advocate and it did work. We ended up going to due process. That wasn't ideal, but we really were able to kind of work through things. So I, I just want people to really be hearing that message that, you know, did we have to do that at the beginning? No, if we would have done it at the beginning, could it have helped us all get on the same page more quickly? I don't know, you know, hindsight is always one of those things, but right. um, there are, so, you know, we've talked in lots of these sessions too, I think in three or four of them about the rights law resource and yep. all those books on there are just so amazing and, you know, great places for people to get um, some basic levels of information or very in-depth if you want to sit and crack open all those books. Yeah, and... no, I definitely <laughs> would recommend them. And, and I agree with you, you know, 
if it's be, if you just feel like you will have more knowledge, if you have even just a friend or another family member coming sitting in with you, or you bring an advocate or an attorney, it's it's not necessarily a it's not a bad thing at all. Um, but like you said, Jen, I think like you don't want to go in guns a blazing. Like let's let's all hear everybody out kind of thing, um, and try and get on the same page. But yes, whatever your comfort level is, and if your comfort level is starting out with an advocate, then by all means, like absolutely do what's best for you and your family and, and your student, um, for sure. And I know I don't see any other questions and I know our time is kind of wrapping up. Um, Jess, can you talk a little bit about what your role is and how you do help parents in your role or um, how people might contact you if they're interested? Yes, I think that's on my notes I have. Hmm. I there we go. Oops. Sorry, everyone. So um, yes, so my role is I, I currently am doing a lot of our community focused um, events right now. We're starting to get back in person. So I'm attending a lot of local education conferences and national conferences um, discussing the um, inclusive education guidelines that we um, disseminated, uh, developing resources for families. So right now um, I'm working on a um, IEP toolkit for families. I'm working really closely with our new employment manager on um, a transition guide uh, that will be really beneficial um, in the future as our kiddos you know, get older and, and move through school and all these post-secondary options. Um, I also handle our education info box and phone lines. Um, I'm more than happy to talk through things with you. Um, you know, if you need to vent, I'm more than happy to listen. Um, and really just if you have those basic, you know, IEP questions or frustrations, I'm more than happy to help. I can't provide legal advice and I can't sit in on your IEP meeting with you, but I'm more than happy to talk through some things if you have questions leading up to your meeting or you need, you want to know, is this okay for me to ask or should I be asking something else? Um, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to, to really work through those things with you and offer um, as much advice as I can um, based on the knowledge I have of, of your state. Um, and so really just getting more resources into the hands of families um, and growing our education program to have um, professional development opportunities for teachers. Um, so that is kind of my big um, priority for this year is we really wanna use these guidelines to develop um, professional development for teachers because I feel like that's a big area that is lacking. Um, and so offering webinars or little clips or some trainings uh, for teachers and educators and admins on the learning profile for students with Down syndrome and how best to educate and resources that are available. Um, and just in general, other inclusive schooling groups. Um, I'm talking to Julie Costin tomorrow about some things. And so um, I'm really excited for the direction of, of where the program is going and, and really, um, I want to hear from the community, like, what are you needing help with education wise? Is there a resource NDSS could develop? Is there, you know, a program or a training that you think is needed? Uh, we really just want to give the community what's going to be most beneficial to them, to you guys. So. Perfect. And um, the other thing I would add to that I just know from across the different groups that we have so many local organizations help yes. in some of these areas and like Jessica said like there's not she doesn't know all the states so talking to your local org about what they know that they can help you with um, I do know that there are some organizations out there that will send somebody to go sit with you at an IEP yes. potentially or you know talk through things before so um, checking with that resource is always a key place to start um, and usually you might not know that especially if you're not super connected into your local org but you know if you ask family or excuse me friends that are locally that have other kiddos with down syndrome they might be able to tell you that or just call and ask them the local orgs love to be able to help and support you and even if it's not something they specifically do they could probably send you to the right resources and get you some support that yeah way, so exactly and I think Christy just put that in the chat that local organizations can provide the resource guidance support 
um, that theirs really helped them when preparing um, transition to kindergarten. Um, you, if you don't know your local group, you can also reach out to me. Um, I work closely with our community engagement manager who knows basically every affiliate across the country and I could get you in contact with the right person or, you know, just search your state or your town for your local Down syndrome group. But like Jen said, if they can't provide you the resources you need from their organization, they likely will have a connection with an advocate or the local ARC or something like that that could um, could help you and provide you with the resources and support that you might need. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. This is such a topic that I know as parents, we have lots of stress about and anxiety about, but you know, I think overwhelmingly people have wonderful experiences with their kids and their schools and what this looks like and how it all works out. There's just so many questions as you start getting into the different systems and learning what things you need to know about it. It's just learning a different world sometimes and um, how to work within that. But um, overwhelmingly, I think it generally goes very well for families. And so having some of this kind of in your mind as you're getting started and getting down the path, hopefully will just give you a little less uh, stress about it, put you a little bit at ease as you're thinking about how to help your kiddo through these different parts of the um, path journey ages and stages, all of that. Um, and remember too, you know, we have um, connections to help you get all into everything here as well. So as you're going down this path, if there's things that you have questions about, we can help get you connected into. Um, I hope that's the biggest thing you're seeing through all of these different sessions is that, you know, there are so many amazing resources out there for you that we can help you find um, somebody in our community, you will know and find out who can help you with that. So it is one of the really awesome things about our little corner of the world. There are just so many people always willing to help you out and uh, get you down the right path. So uh, we'll be wrapping this up, but remember next week we have um, session number six with Karen Hurst, our speech therapist, to kind of give an overview on that for families and um, about what things you might need to know, what questions you might have um, just in general about speech and our kids and then what therapies can look like and just different options and strategies. So we are really looking forward to that one. If you have other questions as we're rolling, remember you can always contact us through the DSDN website, through our Facebook pages, other social medias, whatever that looks like. Just thanks again so much for joining us tonight and representing NDSS. We love to hear from the different organizations just about what things you guys offer at each of your uh, locations and online and um, what that looks like. So we appreciate it tonight. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. Let us know what questions you have. Um, we'll stay on for a few more minutes here, but I am going to stop the recording. If I can figure it out.